Praise the Lord. I said, Praise the Lord. Rise up as we pray together. You commit yourself to the Lord in prayer that the Bible study today will impact your life and influence you and inspire you and do something very definite in your conviction in the Lord. I want you to raise your voice to the Lord and pray that you'll not be a secret disciple, but you'll be a disciple of Jesus Christ who knows what he believes, why he believes. And when the time comes to take a stand and declare who you belong to, you'll do that without any shadow of doubt in the minds of the people that know you and the people that see you. Now whatever comes and whatever goes, whatever happens, whatever does not happen, whatever persecution or pain, Whatever difficulties or trials, whatever challenges may come your way, that you'll take your stand and prove that you have decided to follow the Lord Jesus Christ. There's no turning back. There's no turning back. Whatever the edict of any king, whatever the decree of the princes and the presidents and the persecutors, that the spirit, the courage, the commitment of believers like Daniel will be so much revealed, manifest in your life, manifest in your attitude, that the word of God, the will of God, the might of God, you have committed yourself to nothing will turn you around. Pray that your knees will not be weak in prayer at such a time. Your hands will not be weak, serving the Lord, ministering to the need of the saints at such a time. Your mind will not be weak, neither will you tremble as you look at the fierce faces of the persecutors. At such a time, your decision will be firm, your dedication will be steadfast. Serving the Lord, and heaven will know that you made up your mind to serve the Lord to the very end. Good times, bad times, serve the Lord. Tough times, dangerous times, perilous times, serve the Lord. Challenging times, great times, serve the Lord. Up the mountain top, down deep in the valley, serve the Lord. What a glorious scene it is for you to have testimony like Daniel. Pray that your salvation be a scriptural salvation. Your conversion be a real scriptural conversion. And that your consecration, commitment to serve the Lord will be firm, real, steadfast, scriptural. That you are serving the Lord at all times. Pray you'll not be a bread and butter church goer, only wanting to serve the Lord when it's buttered your bread and all things are all right around you. When there's no persecution, no problem, no pain, anybody can serve the Lord at that time. Even unbelievers go to church and celebrate when they're happy, provided for, when things are working their way. But they drop off for a little challenge. Pray that your service to the Lord will not be hypocritical. Only celebrating and being happy when things go your way. Be strong and steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the worship. In obedience, the work of the Lord, knowing that your worship, your obedience, your work, be rewarded by the Lord. In Jesus' name, we pray. Yeah. And the consecrated people of God said, yeah. Amen. Heavenly Father, we want to worship and thank you once again for the Bible study tonight. Thank you for the worthies of all, the heroes of old. 
worshippers that worshipped you in difficult times and easy times. You told us that these are perilous times in the last days. And Lord, we pray you uh, will be, we'll be able to go on according to these, the steps of these worthies of old. That when on the mountain top in the valley below, rough times and difficult times, then just pray lost times, we'll be able to follow you through. And we're praying, O oh Lord, the grace to serve you and the grace to follow you at all times to grant to us in Jesus' name. Amen. Remember people like Daniel and people like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego that served you in difficult times. And they will not relent, or they will not turn back, they will not regret, or have any kind of second thought. Because of the difficulties and the dangers, the persecution of the pain that came their way. Lord, we pray that we too will have that same spirit of the courageous believer in Jesus' name. At large, at such a time, we'll be able to prove that our service to the Lord is not superficial. It's not hypocritical. That's not just for the people, nominal churchgoers, but that we will show that we're real disciples of the Lord in Jesus' name. That Lord, the grace, the strength, the power, the ability and the skill, the wisdom and the love, the affection for you, that will make us to cleave unto the Lord to the very end. You grant unto every one of us in Jesus' name. Well, thank you, Lord, because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. God bless you. And see now, we come to our Bible study tonight of great joy and great appreciation for the people that have gone before us, the believers, that there may be believers before us. If only the people of today, the believers of today, are the only people we have as examples, it will be very much discouraging because all around us, there are many people that seem to be serving the Lord when the times are going straight and wonderful for them. And when difficulties and dangers come, when persecutions or pain come their way, then they back out. And they're not able to serve the Lord again. But as you look at the believers in Bible days, Bible times, you'll see the real conversion, the real consecration, the real commitment. And you'll see God's commendation for them. We're going to look at just one verse of scripture. There's a lot here. Let's look at Daniel chapter 6. And I'm looking at verse 10. Daniel chapter 6, verse 10. Now, when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went into his house, and his windows being opened in his chamber toward Jerusalem, he kneeled upon his knees three times a day, and prayed and gave thanks before his God, as he did four times. As you look at that verse, I hope you know the background of the verse. And you know why? He went to pray. And when he actually prayed. And what kind of prayer was he actually praying? Look at verse 10 again. Now when Daniel knew that the writing was signed. What writing is that? If you were here last week, we already studied verses 1 to 9. Actually, we came to verse 10. But we reserved very, the very depths of the truth, of the explanation, of the application, and of the teaching, the doctrine we have in verse 10, we reserved it until today. If you read from verse 4, then the presidents and the princes sought to find occasion against Daniel concerning the kingdom. And he could find no occasion, no fault for as much as was faithful. Neither was there any error or fault found in him. Then said, these men, princes, presidents, persecutors, we shall not find any occasion against this Daniel, except we find it against him concerning the law of his God. Then these presidents and princes assembled together to the king, and he said thus unto him, King Darius, live forever. All the presidents of the kingdom, the governors and the princes and the counselors and the captains have consulted together to establish a royal statute 
and to make a firm decree that whosoever shall ask a petition of any god or man for thirty days save of thee, O king, he shall be cast into the lion's den, into the den of lions. Now, O king, establish the decree and sign the writing that it be not changed according to the law of the Medes and the Persians, which altereth not. Wherefore, King Darius signed the writing and the decree. And now, when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he knew that the writing had been signed. I was the content of that writing, of that edict, of that decree, that nobody should pray to any God, to the God of heaven, for 30 days. Now, why would anybody pray? Why would Daniel pray? Why will the children of Israel pray? I want to show you why Daniel prayed. While well, Daniel committed himself to that prayer. And even though the writing had been signed, why? He continued. And he said, this must be done. Let's look at Jeremiah chapter 29. Jeremiah 29, I'm reading from verse 10. For thus says the Lord... That after 70 years be accomplished at Babylon, I will visit you and perform my good word toward you in causing you to return to this place. For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end. Then shall ye call upon me, and ye shall grow and pay unto, and pray unto me, and I will hack in unto you, and ye shall seek me and find me, when ye shall search for me with all your heart. You see the promise the Lord had given to the children of Israel. They'll be going to captivity. And he even mentioned the place of that captivity in verse 10. It will be Babylon. And he'll be spending 70 years in Babylon. After the 70 years, then the people of God, they will remember the covenant of the Lord, the promise of the Lord, and they will remember what the Lord had said, that if at the end of the 70 years they will pray, and pray unto him, that he will deliver them from captivity. And Daniel knew that. And because of that, he committed himself to that kind of prayer. And this now came as, notice this word, an important word, distraction, distraction. His mind was bent on praying so that the people of God, the nation of the nation of the children of Israel, they'll be delivered out of the land of captivity, out of Babylon. And because he committed himself to the prayer of deliverance for the children of Israel, for the nation, for the whole nation, the distraction came from the devil. And that, you know that's something the devil always does. God gives you a commission. Gives you a vision, gives you a promise, and makes a covenant with you. And then you set your mind to pursue that vision, that glorious commitment that the Lord puts in your hand. And then the devil, he wants to cause distraction so that your mind will go up that prayer. Your mind will go up that covenant. Your mind will go up that, that covenant of the Lord, that commission. And so that's exactly what the devil was doing through those princes and presidents and the persecutors had listened. But Daniel knew. And Daniel said, I'm not going to get distracted. I'm praying for the nation of Israel. And then he said, I'm just an individual. And this is a whole nation. What if they throw me into the lion's den? That will be all right. That will be all right for one person to sacrifice his life. And for, to die in the lion's den for the deliverance of the whole nation. That's all right. Did it Moses have that commitment? Oh Lord, if you'll not forgive the children of Israel, take my name out of the book which you have written and, and blot me out that I am willing to get expended or to even lose my place in the kingdom because of the nation. Did Paul, the apostle, have that attitude too? He said, I will willingly even be a cause if I could, if that will bring the salvation of the whole of Israel. It's what the people of God always have in their heart. That whatever comes, and whatever goes, whatever the persecution, whatever the pain, whatever the problem, whatever the challenge, the 
know that what they do is for the deliverance, the salvation, the conversion of the whole nation. And because of that, they are not going to bend or yield or give up their commitment. That's why Daniel continued to pray when he knew that the writing was signed. He said, that is a distraction. And I'm not going to allow that distraction. I'm going to keep on doing what I know I need to do for the salvation of my people, the deliverance of my people, and for the release of the children of Israel out of captivity. Notice that word I gave you, distraction. Distraction. The devil does that every time. The devil is still doing that today. When you commit, when you commit yourself to something great, something wonderful, something that's a great commission from the Lord, and then you're doing it and doing it and doing it, and then something will come on the sideline. A distraction. And many people will leave the major thing the Lord has given them. And they will leave the substance. They'll be, sh- they'll be chasing the shadows. And they'll leave the treasure. I'll be chasing the toys. They leave the reality and then they'll be, they'll be chasing the mirage of life. But Daniel said, No, you will not distract me. I'm going to keep on doing what I know is right to be done. In 2 Chronicles chapter 6. 2 Chronicles chapter 6. I'm reading from verse, from verse 34. If thy people go out to war against their enemies by the way, that thou shalt send them, and they pray unto thee toward this city. You know, Daniel, Daniel knew the scripture. He said, if your people go to war, and they're losing that battle, and they're going to be captured, and then they pray. How do they pray? They pray towards their city. That's Jerusalem. That's why we read in Daniel chapter 6 verse 10, he opened his windows, and then he faced Jerusalem so that he could pray. I want you to look at verse 37. Verse 37, it says, If yet, if they bethink themselves in the land whither they are carried captive, do you see that? If they're taking captive and they don't think about their lives, they think about their ways, they think about their backsliding, if they bethink themselves in the place that is whither they are being carried captive and turn and pray unto thee in the land of their captivity. That's what Daniel was doing. It was in the land of captivity. In Babylon. And then he thought of what brought them to that captivity. And he prayed. He wasn't praying about those princes and presidents. He wasn't praying about those enemies. If he were to be praying about them, that would be a distraction. The real prayer. The important prayer. The essential prayer was for the deliverance of the whole nation. From captivity. And that's what he concentrated on. In verse 38. If they return to thee with all their heart. And with all their soul. In the land of their captivity. Where the day have been carried. Where they, they, where they have carried them captive. And pray towards this land. You see that? And pray. Towards this land. That is while they are there in Babylon. In the land of captivity, they turn their mind, their heart, their eyes, their faces through their windows, and they turn to this land which thou givest on their givest on their fathers, and toward the city which thou hast chosen. That's Jerusalem. They face Jerusalem. They look at Jerusalem far off. And they say, Jerusalem has been destroyed, devastated. And we're praying for the restoration of Jerusalem. And they will not allow anything happening in the land of captivity to destroy them. Then the Lord said, they will hear. And toward the house which are built for thy name. Then hear thou from heaven, from the heavens. Even from thy dwelling place, their prayer and their supplications. And maintain their cause and forgive thy people which have sinned against thee. We're looking at Psalm 122. It just to show us why Daniel kept on praying. Oh, he said the deliverance of Israel as a whole nation. And that's more important than my safety. It's more important than my security. I'm just an individual alive. And he was about 90 years old already. 
And the people of God have spent 70 years in captivity. And if a person like Daniel will not pray for the deliverance and salvation of that whole nation, who else will pray? That's why he said, it's all right. If they throw me to the lands, then I can do that. I can suffer that. How many people have died in the siege? How many people have died in captivity? How many people have died in the war against the land of Israel? And their death meant nothing. They died in their sin. If I will die in the lion's den for praying for Israel, and that prayer will deliver Israel, the people of God, out of captivity, it's worth it. That's why he didn't give up, and you will not give up. Do not allow the persecution and the problem and the things people do or say to distract you from the real sin that the Lord has committed into us. Psalm 122. I'm reading from verse 2 there. In verse 2 here is what it says. A feet shall stand within thy gates of Jerusalem. Jerusalem is builded as a city that is compact, that is compact together. Whether the tribes go up and the tribes of the Lord unto the testimony of Israel to give thanks unto, thy, unto the name of the Lord. For there are such thrones of judgment and the thrones of the house of David. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. They shall prosper that love thee. You see that? That's why he faced Jerusalem. He was praying. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. I want you to look at Daniel chapter 9. Daniel chapter 9. I'm reading from verse 1. You see the kind of prayer he prayed. And you know that it was Darius reigning at this time. This was the very first year when, da when Darius came to the throne. Belshazzar had gone. And now that Darius was there, he wanted to set Daniel, he wanted to promote him. But Daniel said, well, that promotion is not as important to me as the prayer I need to pray for Israel. That promotion, exaltation of man, is not as important as the deliverance of the children of Israel. Therefore, I'm going to pray. And those people rose up, and they wanted to keep the whole nation of Israel in captivity. And that's why they didn't want Daniel to pray. That's why the destruction, destruction. I don't want you to forget that word all through this study. That's why that destruction came. And he said, I will not yield to that destruction. The major sin, the essential thing I need to do is to pray for the salvation, for the release of the children of Israel. Let's look at Daniel chapter 9, verse 1. In the first year of Darius, the son of Ahasuerus, you see that, of the seed of the Medes, which was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans. In the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by the books the number of the years whereof the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah the prophet, that he would accomplish seventy years in desolation of Jerusalem. And I searched my face unto the Lord to seek by prayer and supplication. You see that? He said, I knew the time had come. The time for the deliverance, salvation, release of the children of Israel. Because of that, I search my face unto the Lord. And then he said, by prayer and by supplication. That tells you the reason why he prayed. And the reason why he opened the windows. Why he faced Jerusalem. We're looking at Isaiah chapter 62. Isaiah chapter 62. We're looking at verse 1. For Zion's sake, I will not hold my peace. For Jerusalem's sake, I will not rest until the righteousness thereof go forth as brightness and the salvation thereof as a lamp that burneth. You now see, you understand? The heart of Daniel, the mind of Daniel, the commitment of Daniel, the perception, the perception of Daniel. He said, we have to pray for this. The nation has to be delivered out of captivity. And the city of Jerusalem must become, once again, a praise in all the earth. And we need to pray for this because the Lord has said, this is what I want you to do. But the people of God must hold my hand, move my hand through prayer. Daniel's purpose earlier in life was not superficial. The strength of his firm purpose carried him through his old age. Though he was a captive in Babylon, he was courageous, not cowardly. 
is standing by his godly conviction. He did not think that when you are in Rome, you must do as the Romans do. There are some people like that. And their, their religion is for the climate or the weather. When it's cold, they are cold. When it's hot, they are hot. When it's humid, they are humid. And when it's lukewarm, they look lukewarm. When the economy is down, then their courage is down. But in the case of Daniel, he was just a man of principle. And he said, this is what to do. And this is what he will do. And if you're a real Christian, a real born again child of God, that's what your heart will be. He was as righteous in Babylon as he had been in Jerusalem. To him, it mattered not whether his actions brought him loss or gain, frown or favor, pain or persecution or, or, or pleasure, the condemnation of the world or the commendation of the world, cause what it might. Righteousness was always his best policy. Each of us needs such a spirit of decision, a spirit of dedication, a spirit of devotion in times like these. Why would Daniel be so particular? Were there not other Jews in the land who kept their religion to themselves and quietly refrained from attracting attention to their conviction? The temptation to look at other people is always strong. But in the case of Daniel, he was not going to yield to any pressure to compromise. He was being considered for the highest position in the government. But you know what Daniel thought was the point, was the use. Being promoted to the highest place in the land of captivity. And a nation, the people of God, had not regained their release. He said, What's the point? Being promoted. And I'm asking you again, What's the point being promoted to a high place in this land, in the world, when the commission to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature, when the commission the Lord has given you is not being done, it's been eroded. And in fact, they want to keep you away from that commission because of that promotion. That's why Daniel said, no, I don't want that. I don't need that. All I want is to be able to carry out what the Lord, the commission the Lord had given. No position in an earthly government was as important to Daniel as a place in the kingdom of God. So might uh, some might have said it is the law of the land not to pray to God, but God's children are under a higher law. And the Bible says we ought to obey God rather than men. Daniel's heart was set and settled. I pray in that same way your heart will be set and settled in Jesus' name. His decision was not floating in his head. His decision was deep-rooted in his heart. I pray it will so happen to every one of us in Jesus' name. We're going to look at uh, the study tonight in three, in three points. Number one, Daniel's uncommon den. Daniel's uncommon den. Number two, Daniel's uncompromising decision. I believe you have such a decision. I said you have such a decision that no matter what those people of the world, what they may do, that you have that uncompromising decision. Number three, Daniel's unconditional devotion. I come to number one. Daniel's uncommon den. We're looking at Daniel chapter six. Daniel chapter six, verse 10. Now when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went into his house and his windows being open in his chamber toward Jerusalem. He kneeled down his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as he did a four time. The writing had been signed. Look at verse 7. It says in verse 7, all the presidents of the kingdom and the governors and the princes, the counselors and the captains have consulted together to establish a royal statute and to make a firm decree that whosoever shall ask a petition of any god or man for thirty days, save of thee, O king, he shall be cast into the den of lions. Into the den of lions. But you know that Daniel, he had faith. Not just prayer. Well, prayer is wonderful. It must be the prayer of faith. But you know, he had real faith in God. We're well, looking at Hebrews chapter 11, verse 33. Hebrews 11, verse 33. 
Whose through faith subdued kingdoms. Whose through faith wrought righteousness. Whose through faith obtained promises. And who through that same faith stopped the mouths of lions. Through faith stopped the mouths of lions. The question is, is anybody being cast into a lion's den today? And you say no. Is there any arena, any stadium, any pitch, any hole where lions are kept? And believers are being thrown to the lions today. And you say no. If the answer is no, and nobody is being thrown to the lion's den today, why do we study about the lion's den? And about Daniel taking his turn. And even though he knew the danger, the peril was to be thrown into the lion's den, he still was uncompromising. And he took his turn. And if people are not being thrown into the lion's den today, why are we studying this? I'll tell you. Look at Romans chapter 15 verse 4. Romans chapter 15. What do you need from verse 4? Here in Romans chapter 15 verse 4. And whatsoever things were written in our time. Were written for our learning. That is, whatsoever things were written. Daniel included. Daniel chapter 6 included. Daniel chapter 6 verse 10 included. All these things that were written in our time. They were written for our learning. That we through patience and the comfort of the scriptures might have hope. It says they are reaching for learning. Therefore we need to learn from them. First Corinthians chapter 10 verse 11. In First Corinthians 11 verse, uh, verse 10, verse, chapter 10 verse 11, now all these things happen unto them. For example, and they are reaching for our admonition. It happened to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They are reaching for admonition. It happened to Daniel. And it's reaching for our admonition. And it says in that verse 11, They are reaching for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. It says in these last days, that we need to learn. What happened to Daniel? What edict? What writing was signed? What did the persecutors imagine to do? And what was it that they actually wanted to carry out? What was their plan and their purpose and their goal? And then what was their attitude and the commitment and the consecration of Daniel? It says, it is reaching us so that you and I may learn and take comfort and then become patient in whatever we're going through and then be able to have the victory. And we're going to have the victory in Jesus' name. Give me a good, good amen. amen. I said, now there may not be a stadium, an arena, where they park lions and throw the believers there. Why then are we studying this? Look at this in Psalm 7, verses 1 and 2. Psalm 7, verses 1 and 2. O oh Lord, my God, in thee do I put my trust. Save me from all them that persecute me. And deliver me, lest he tear my soul like a lion. Lest he tear my soul like a lion. There are persecutors whose faces are fierce, as fierce as that of a lion. There are people who are lion-like in their mind, in their pursuit, in their nature, in their depravity. They are brute beasts. They're lions. All they want to do is to tear the Daniels of today in pieces. All they want to do is to destroy Daniels of today from praying. All they want to do is to destroy Daniels of today from carrying on the great commission that the Lord had given to them. And because that lion like people like that, lion minded people, people whose minds and hearts and goals and dreams and purpose and plan, they're like that of the lion wanting to tear the people of God in to pieces. That's why I was studying this. And then we see that Daniel, who had been a believer of the, of the Lord before us, how he took his stand so that we too will learn how to take our stand. You'll take your stand. And then the Lord will deliver you from those lion-like people in Jesus' name. Lest he tear my soul like a lion, rending each in pieces, while there is none to deliver. We're looking at Psalm 10, Psalm 10. And I'm reading from verse 2. In Psalm 10, from verse 2. The wicked in his pride does persecute the poor. The wicked people, they're like the lions. You'll see it now. 
Let them be taken in the devices that they have imagined. For the wicked boasteth of his heart's desire, and blessed the covetous whom the Lord abhorreth. The wicked, through the pride of his countenance, will not seek after God. God is not in all his thoughts. Like those princes and those presidents, the persecutors. God was not in their thoughts. Was not in their plan. They didn't plan to worship God. And they wanted to hinder any other person. Wanted to worship God. That's why they said, if anybody will pray to any other God, to any God, for these 30 days, except to thee, O king, he'll be thrown into the lion's den. It says in verse 5, his ways are always, are always grievous, that judgments are far above, out of his sight. As for all his enemies, he perfects at them. He has said in his heart, I shall not be moved, for I shall never be in adversity. His mouth is full of cursing and deceit and fraud. Under his tongue is mischief and vanity. He seated and the law in places of the villages and in the secret places does he murder the innocent his eyes are pre privily set against the poor he lies in wait as a lion in his den that's why i was studying this there are persecutors who are set on destroying the believer who are set on destroying the children of god on the servants of god and because they are set and they are de determined like the lion that they will break the believers, they will break the believers' courage, believers' commitment, believers' conviction. And the believers' conviction, they are going to tear everything in pieces. That's why we are learning about Daniel. That even to those people, they said that nobody should pray to the God of heaven except to the king for these 30 days. He knew what they wanted to do. They wanted to crush his mind, this heart, his spirit. They wanted to crush his boldness and fearlessness. They wanted to crush his conviction and his commitment, consecration to the Lord. And he said, it will not happen. And she Day, it will not happen. That those persecutors, they want to turn you back from the way to heaven. That's why they do what they do. That's why they say what they say. And that's why they are so determined. And then they bring up an edict. Or they bring up a law. Or they bring up a writing. And then they conspire together. They say, this is what we are going to do. If anybody will carry on with the vision, that heavenly vision. But like Daniel, will go on. I said we'll go on. In Psalm 57, Psalm 57, I'm reading from verse 4, Psalm 57, and I'm reading there from verse 4. In verse 4 it says, my soul is among, among what? Among lions. I, I lie, I lie even among them that are set on fire. Even the sons of men whose teeth are the spears, are spears and arrows, and their tongue a sharp sword. Look at verse 7. My heart is fixed to God. My heart is fixed. The psalmist said, my soul is among the lions. It's like, I mean, lions dead. And all these men, you look at their faces, their fears, as fierce as a lion. And you look at them, and you know their goal, their purpose, their desire, their determination, their commitment. It's like they'll tear me in pieces like the lions will tear Daniel in pieces. All the same, in verse 7, my heart is fixed to God. My heart is fixed. That's what happened to Daniel. His heart was fixed. He said, I'm going to pray. I want the deliverance and the release of the children of Israel from captivity. And if I don't pray, who else will pray? And if I'm afraid of the lion's den, who will be able to pick up courage if I'm not able to pick up the courage? Daniel said, as I am forced in purity, as I'm forced in holiness, as I'm forced in understanding the vision of the Lord, I will be forced also in prayer. I'll be forced in consecration. I'll be forced in commitment. And I'll be forced in carrying out that commitment, even though it means the lion's den. And I pray the Lord will give us that same commitment in Jesus' name. And the lions all cease in the Old Testament because now we're in the New Testament. And let's look at let's look at First Peter chapter five. First Peter chapter five, and we're looking at it from verses eight and nine. The lions of the day of this time want you to crush, want you to destroy the people of God. 
but they will not succeed. I said they will not succeed. First Peter chapter 5, verse 8, be sober, be vigilant. Because your adversary, the devil, as what? As a running, that's why we're studying this. As a running lion. As a running lion. It's like in a cave, in a dungeon, in a den. And it's waiting there. And it says, if you will pray for the people of God to be released, and if you will preach for the people that need to be saved to get saved, Satan doesn't like that. And he will roar against you as a running lion. But then it says, he walketh about seeking whom he may devour, whom receives steadfast in the faith. Steadfast in the faith. That's commitment. That's courage. That's consistency. That's perseverance. That's persistence. That is, you stay persistent. That even though the devil, like a running lion, is seeking whom he may devour. And he wants to destroy and devour. The people that are bent and determined and committed to the great commission, wanting to do the will of the Lord, you know that if you will resist him by faith, he will fail and you will succeed. It says, some resist in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. I'm looking at Second Timothy chapter 4. Second Timothy, we're looking at chapter 4. And we're looking at the experience of Paul the Apostle. Second Timothy chapter 4. And I'm looking at verse 16. At my first answer, no man stood with me. But all men forsook me. I pray God that he be not laid upon to their charge. Notwithstanding the Lord stood with me. And strengthened me. And by my, by, so that by me. With the preaching might be fully known, and that all the Gentiles might hear. And I was delivered out of the mouth of what? Of the lion. And why was the lion against him, against, against Paul the apostle? So that the Gentiles will not hear the gospel. So that the Gentiles will not be saved. So that sinners that Jesus Christ died for will not hear the gospel of salvation. That's why the lion rose up. But Paul the apostle said, By me, the preaching of the gospel must be fully known. So that all the Gentiles will hear the gospel of salvation. And because he determined like Daniel, he said, I was delivered from the mouth of the lion. The Lord will keep on delivering you. And the Lord shall deliver me out of every evil war. Give me a good amen. amen. And preserve me unto his heavenly kingdom. Another amen. amen. To whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. amen. You see, Daniel has such a great lesson for you and for me. He has such a great instruction for you and for me. That as he went through the lion's den with you, with real decision, commitment, dedication, devotion, we will go through whatever comes our way. And the great work and the great service the Lord had given us, we're not going to allow any distraction of the enemy to turn us aside. And we're going to keep on doing it in Jesus' name. This president and the princes conspired against Daniel. They, by flattery and deception, perverted the king's mind to pass an unchangeable edict. The penalty for disobeying the king's decree was death in the lion's den. The situation would have put Daniel in great dilemma, but his first allegiance was to the king of kings, and his fearless, unqualified obedience was to the law and the edict of the everlasting kingdom. The great trial did not crush his spirit of praise. Still, he prayed and gave thanks before his God as he did aforetime. And the Lord will keep us in that same commitment in Jesus' name. It must have been hard going forward, but it's worse going back. Because if Daniel had gone back and did not pray for the release of the children of Israel from captivity, then the whole nation in their millions, millions, will remain in captivity. That's more terrible. And if we allow persecution and difficulty or the pain and the pressures and the problems of the day, 
And the intention and the program of the lions of the day, the persecutors of the day, if we're not there to distract us, and then we're not concentrating only praying against the princes, against the president, against the persecutors, against all the challenges, against all the problems, and we leave the prayer, the prayer for the salvation of the world, and the prayer for the conversion of sinners, and the prayer for the fulfillment of the Great Commission. We leave all that alone, and we're distracted all. We're praying for that lion's den, lion's den. They want to throw me into the lion's den. Oh God, hear my prayer. If we now change the prayer, and we go from the national value of the prayer to a personal dedication of just me, me, me. That's what many Christians have done in many churches because they have been distracted to personal things and now they have left the great thing that the Lord has committed to their hands. We will not do that in Jesus' name. What if Daniel was centered on position, position of exaltation? Exaltation. Now I'm going to be promoted to this high position. And if I pray and they discover that I pray, then he'll throw me to a lion's den and I will lose the opportunity of being exalted into the place of a high position. And isn't that what has captured the hearts of many people today? They want position in the church, exaltation in the church. A title in the church. And the great commission the Lord has given us, we abandon that. And our distraction is on position, position, position. And then position in politics, position in the world. And because they want that position in the world, because of position, 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 then the great commission is left. But then they all said, no. I know that if I compromise and give up and give in and yield and turn my back, on a great commission for the deliverance of the nation of Israel. I know that I'll be in the good book of the king. And the will see promote me. I don't want that kind of promotion. Do you want that kind of promotion? Position in the church. Do you want position in the church when sinners are dying? And the Lord has given us a great commission. And the people are not following through on that great commission. So that they can preserve their position. And if anybody is going to kind of hinder them from having that position, they want to, they want to now concentrate on pulling that person down. That's all their, all their kind of proposal or their project now. All they want to do is just pull somebody down so they can get a position. And we're distracted from the great commission the Lord has given us. We'll come back to that great commission. And then we'll be able to say like Paul the Apostle, I was not disobedient unto the heavenly vision. You'll not be disobedient in Jesus' name. Give me a good, good amen. amen. We're looking at point number two, Daniel's uncompromising decision. Daniel's uncompromising decision. We're coming to Daniel chapter 6 and in verse 10. Now, when Daniel knew, I love that word, he knew. I love that word, knew. When he knew, look up brothers and sisters. You know there are some believers, churchgoers, so-called Christians. If there is any plan, any plot, any problem, they say, don't tell me. Don't tell me. If I don't know, then I live a free life. Then I can keep on serving the Lord. But you know, if you tell me about my problem, about the persecutors, about the plot, about the people that want to destroy my life, if you let me know, it will discourage me. And then I'll be so fearful, I'll not be able to control what I'm doing. But Daniel knew. When Daniel knew, there's no problem that you know. You ought to know. What the princes and the, pro- and the presidents, what they're doing, what they're planning. That you know doesn't bring any problem if you are committed to the Lord. If you are consecrated to the Lord, if you have made up your mind, you'll serve the Lord until the end. Whatever you know doesn't matter. Why is it that they're telling me that so and so is your enemy? Don't worry about that. Why is it they're telling me that this kind of persecution is coming? This kind of problem is coming? Don't worry about that. When Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went into his house and his windows being opened in his chamber toward Jerusalem. He kneeled upon his knees three times a day and he prayed and gave thanks before his God as he did aforetime. Everybody say, as he did aforetime. Tell me that again. Say that again. As he did a fourth time. Rainy season, dry season, as he did a fourth time. 
fruitfulness, barrenness, as he did aforetime. Happy, sad, as he did aforetime. And the lions then waiting for him, or promotion waiting for him, as he did aforetime. Up on the mountain top, deep down in the valley below, as he did aforetime. My brothers and sisters, that's Christianity. That's how to serve the Lord. That whatever a person may be going through your commitment of many years, your dedication of many years, and your devotion of many years, and your decision of many years, and your determination, perseverance of many years must continue. We'll continue serving the Lord. I said we'll continue serving the Lord. And you know, that's exactly what they did in those Bible times. They kept on serving the Lord. Even when the Pharisees and the Sadducees were against them, all they did was just keep on serving the Lord. Acts of the Apostles chapter 5. Acts of the Apostles chapter 5, obviously, they must have learned a lot from Daniel. Daniel's decision was the decision of a single-minded believer. He knew his duty towards God and he did he did not waver or confer with flesh and blood. He did not seek the advice of godly minded people. His faith was steadfast. His composure was calm and unruffled. His conduct remained consistent with his conviction. His conscience affirmed obedience to God above allegiance to any man on earth. God's word, not the decree of earthly kings, was his guide in life. He had decided for the truth and he was not going to sell the truth at any price. Oh, for a heart like Daniel's to follow and to obey Christ at all as us, to be a real Christian and to be steadfast till the end. A man must, must possess such decision of character. So many people fail and falter. They fall from the Christian race because of lack of a firm purpose. They start with a great enthusiasm and glowing testimony. Then they allow themselves to be diverted from their purpose. A man of unswerving, unswerving, unswerving decision learns to keep his mind on the Lord. That is, whatever the challenge may be, whatever the dedication, dedication of the enemy, determination of the enemy might be, you want to keep on serving the Lord, keeping your eyes on the eternal things that will make you, that will make you know that sin and compromise will lose the attraction. A firm commitment to God and His will, whatever may arise, that will keep you standing for the truth at all times. Such a firm decision keeps our hearts at rest and we leave the outcome in God's hand. Get on, keep on serving the Lord. Leave the outcome in God's hand. The presidents and the princes, they have conspired together. Leave the outcome in God's hand. They have signed the decree already. Leave the outcome in God's hand. The lion's den is waiting for the uncompromising believer. Don't worry about that. Keep on serving the Lord, worshipping the Lord, and keep on with the great commission, preaching the gospel unto every creature, and praying unto the Lord for the deliverance of the souls that are held in the captivity of sin. And you leave the outcome in in God's hand, the great thing for us is to know the will of God and to keep on doing that will of God. That whatever is happening, whatever the plot, persecution, and whatever the pressure, that you keep on doing the will of God that you know. Decisions make the man. And what made Daniel? The decision to stand firm unto the end. That made Daniel. Firm decisions make firm men with strong backbone. Break a man's ability to take decision. And you break and destroy that man. It was Babylon's determination to break the wheel and the overthrow the faith of those three faithful worshippers of the true God. Babylon failed and the old time faith was purified and preserved in the fire. On our behalf, Babylon today will fail. And we will keep on preserving this faith once delivered unto the saints in Jesus' name. And then in the case of Daniel, it was a middle Persian's determination to destroy or weaken the result and a commitment and consecration of worship of Daniel. Daniel's commitment to the law of his God was stronger than their determination because of the faithfulness of believers who have lived before us and their willingness to be cast into the furnace of fire or to be cast into the lion's den. That's the reason why the faith once delivered to the saints is still living on today. They have searched 
worship the Lord and they preserve the truth in their own generation. This is our own generation. We're going to serve the Lord and preserve the truth for the coming generation in Jesus' name. Look at Acts of the Apostles, chapter 5. Acts chapter 5, verse 17. Then the high priest rose up. And all they that were with him, which is the sect of the Sadducees, and were filled with indignation, and he laid hands, their hands, on the apostles, and put them in the common prison. But the angel of the Lord by night opened the prison doors, and brought them forth, and said, Go stand, speak, and speak in the temple to the people all the words of this life, all the words of this life. You see, those apostles, they have been preaching the gospel, the gospel of life eternal. And many people were coming to know the Lord. And then those Pharisees and Sadducees and the high places, they, be, they are people, they became kind of unhappy with that. And they were indignant, angry about that. And they threw them in the prison. But imprisonment, that was to be a distraction, a distraction, so that the church now will be nursing their wounds. Look at our predicament and look at our problem and look at the imprisonment. Oh Lord, what are you looking at? They will be praying only for themselves now. Distraction. But you know, the church will not be distracted by that, whether imprisonment or not, pain or gain, whatever it whatever may come. They will still continue preaching the word. An angel came from heaven and delivered them and said, go and stand and speak in the temple to the people. All the words of this life, the important thing is concentrate concentrate on what the Lord has called us to. Look at verse 27. And when they had brought them, they brought them, they sent them before the council. And the high priest asked them, saying, Did not we straightly charge you, command you, that you should not teach in this name? And behold, ye have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine, and intend to bring this man's blood upon us. Then Peter and the other apostles answered and said, We ought to obey God rather than who? Tell me out loud. Right, amen. That means then the commitment will continue. Consecration will continue. Look at Acts chapter 8. Acts chapter 8 verse 1. And Saul was consenting unto his death. And at that time, there was a great persecution against the church which was at Jerusalem. And they were all scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. Great persecution. Great persecution. That's spending not just one day, one week, one month. That's spending some time in the lion's den. Persecution. Look at verse 4. They are four. They that were scattered abroad went everywhere. What were they doing? Preaching the word. They will not allow the destruction of the persecution. The destruction of the determination of those persecutors to distract them. Or to lead them astray. They knew the important thing to be done. And at all times... At all times, whatever the situation and whatever, whether there are friends or foes, persecutors or peace lovers, whoever they are, whatever they do, we must keep on in that great commission. We're looking at chapter 12. Chapter 12 of Acts. Acts chapter 12, verse 6. And when Herod would have brought him forth, the same night Peter was sleeping between two soldiers. Think about that. Herod wanted to bring him forth and to kill him. That's Peter. But the same night, Peter was sleeping. Oh, he said, I know that all I'm to do is to preach the gospel. And if I finish preaching and I'm ready to go, no problem. But if I've not finished and there's still work to do, there's still the gospel to be preached, and a great commission is still to be carried on, then the Lord knows I'm available. I'm an instrument of God, and He will come and deliver me. And so, if it is by death, I'll glorify the Lord. If it's by life, I'll glorify the Lord. And because of that, He slept. There was no anxiety or worry or panic or fear in the heart. And then we're told that he was bound between two angels, between two uh, chains. A uh, chains between a uh, two chains, and the keepers before the door kept the prison. And behold, the angel of the Lord came upon him, and a light shined in the prison, and he smote Peter on the side and raised him up, and said, Arise up quickly, and his chains fell off from his hand. The chains were fallen off. 
and the release is for the preaching of the gospel. It is not just to go and hide somewhere. Thank God I'm through. Thank God I overcame that. Thank God the angel brought me out of the prison. Now nobody will see me again. I'll go and hide myself somewhere. The deliverance is so that you can carry on. The word of the Lord. The healing is so that you can carry on the word of the Lord. The preservation of your life is so that you can carry on the word of the Lord. The important thing is this great commission. The Lord knew that that imprisonment came just as a distraction. And then the Lord brushed off and crushed and destroyed and removed that distraction. Then the preaching of the word must continue. It will continue. I said it will continue. Look at verse 24. But the word of God grew and multiplied. The word of God grew and multiplied. That's what the Lord has preserved us for. That's what we're going to do in Jesus' name. I'm looking at chapter 14, Acts chapter 14. And I'm reading there from verse 1. And it came to pass in Iconium. That they went both toward, uh, together into the synagogue of the Jews. So and so spake that a great multitude, both of Jews and of the Greeks, believed. You see what happened in verse 1? A great multitude of the Jews, of the Gentiles, of the Greeks believed. Now destruction will come. I told you, any time you're preaching the gospel... Anytime you're praying for the deliverance of the whole nation, anytime you want people to benefit from the atonement of the Lord Jesus Christ that he accomplished on the cross of Calvary, every time you're desiring the salvation of sinners, destruction will come. Destruction will come. But don't you be bogged down, tied down to that destruction. And don't you start fighting the mirage and fighting all that kind of shadowy battle. And say, now I'm going to leave the preaching of the gospel. I'm going to leave the deliverance of the whole nation. I'm not going to fight in this battle. No, he just knows that's what the devil wants to do. He wants to distract your attention so you'll not continue preaching the gospel. But this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all nations before the end of the world will come. Look at verse 2. But the unbelieving Jews stirred up the Gentiles and made their minds evil affected against the brethren. That's the distraction. Well, what will they do then? Persecution has come. Difficulties have come. This dangerous. This a perilous time. Look at verse 3. Long time, therefore. Therefore. That means because of the persecution. And because of that destruction, and because the devil thinks it will crush their conviction and commitment, so they will not preach the gospel again, even because of that. Therefore, long time about they speaking boldly in the Lord, which gave testimony of the unto the word of his grace, and granted signs and wonders to be done by their hands. That same thing will happen again. Acts chapter 20. Acts chapter 20. We're looking at verse 24. But none of these things moved me. Daniel could have said that. I know they signed a writing, but none of these things moved me. I know the princes and the presidents are not happy, but these things do not move me. I know the persecutors are rising up in a great number, and they are conspiring with the king, but none of these things move me. And that's what you should be telling the Lord. The Lord has called you to salvation, called you to sanctification, and called you to submission to the will of God. It's called you to service. And then you say, yes, I know the difficulties are there, the dangers are there, the peril is there, the imprisonment is there, the pain is there. But then it says, none of these things move me, neither count I my life down to myself, so that I might finish my cause with sorrow. What what? What what? What joy, what joy. The joy of being selected by the Lord. And the joy of being appointed by the Lord. The joy that God has favored you. And then he has given you the great gospel to preach. 
the gospel of grace, the joy of the knowledge of the word of God, the joy of the spirit of God abiding. That whatever it is, Paul the apostle said, all those things do not move me. I know it's destruction. And now I'm going to keep on preaching the gospel that I might finish my cause with joy and the ministry which I've received of who? Of who? Of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. We're going to do it in Jesus' name. And you'll see then that just like Daniel, Moses, Joshua, David, and the rest of them, they took their stand. And if they took their stand, which you did too, we can take our stand. And we're going to keep on doing what the Lord has called us to do in Jesus' name. No distraction. Everybody say no distraction. Tell me that again. Say that again. No discouragement. Can you say that? Say that again. Say that again. No disappointment. Can you say that? Say that again. Say that for the last time. You know, you understand those, when you think like that and say, oh, there's no distraction, there's no discouragement, and there's no, there's no disappointment. I'll keep on doing what the Lord has ca- called me to do. You'll succeed and you'll have the victory in Jesus' name. I'm coming back to Daniel chapter 6 and verse 10. Daniel chapter 6, and we're looking at verse 10. Daniel's unconditional devotion. Daniel's unconditional devotion. We're looking at Daniel chapter 6. And in verse 10, Daniel chapter 6, verse 10. Now, when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went into his house, and his windows being opened in a chamber toward Jerusalem. He kneeled upon his knees three times a day, and he prayed and gave thanks before his God, and as he did a fourth time. I want you to notice that again. Now, when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went where? Look at that verse 10. He went into, tell me out loud. He went into his house. You know what some other people will do? Some other people will go to their houses. I know what you are saying against me. I know what you are planning against me. I know you are one of them. I know you are there. He didn't go to their houses. He went to his own house. Leave all those persecutors alone. Don't confront them. Don't challenge them. I don't say you are going to even discuss with them. They will not even hear. They made up their minds. This is the project they want to carry on. This is what they want to do. Daniel did not go to their houses. He went to his own house. He didn't allow them to give him a new assignment, a new job, a new battle, fighting, a lost battle. He didn't confront them. He went to his own house and he kneeled in prayer. He knelt in prayer, and then he gave thanks unto the Lord, as he did a fourth time. That's devotion. Daniel's devotion took him to the lion's den, but also brought him in contact with an angel of God in the lion's den. He said, the Lord has sent his angels, and they have shut the lion's mouths. That they could not hurt me because I have not done evil against the O king or against anyone. That was his commitment. And then you see here, his consistent devotional life was the result of his fearless disposition of heart. He was about 90 years of old at this time. About 90 years old. And yet, the man kept on doing what the Lord had called him to do. At 50, you will continue. At 60, you will continue. At 70, will you continue? At 80, will you continue? At 90, can you continue? Till the end of your life, you will continue in Jesus' name. And and you know why those people, people like Daniel, you know why they continue like that? Because they did not count any man as so great, so important, as, as if any man could stop them. In fact, he had what we call a holy contempt against those persecutors. And he said, what they say, what they do, what they plan, what they plot will not matter. 
and therefore he continued even till old age his purpose of heart as a young man was still vibrant in his old age his heart was fixed no decree of man could swerve him from his devotion to his god compromisers never open i uh, open themselves and they're never above board they conceal the real character. In the case of Daniel, his commitment to God was well known before the decree. And that commitment continued during the period of the decree. Daniel and his devotion to God outlived all his persecutors and their decree. You will outlive all your persecutors. All their plots, you will outlive in Jesus' name. The decree could not conquer his spirit of devotion. Neither could the lions crush the bones of his body. Daniel's conscience would not allow him to keep his conviction and devotion secret. He was too honest to live under false pretense. He was not ashamed to confess and serve his God openly. Faithful as Daniel was to the king, there was a point at which his earthly interest stopped. One's earthly relations and authorities demanded that he should disregard or dishonor God. He was instantly inflexible. No desire for worldly recognition or no fear for real punishment could lessen his consecration, commitment, devotion unto God. This has ever been the mark and the moral strength of all true children of God in all the ages. The world may try to frighten us with their edicts and their decrees or entice us with their promises and prom promotions and privileges, but they will try in vain. I said they will try in vain. Nothing will diminish our love, our God, and for our Savior. Let us then prayerfully trust and obey our God. And the fear of man which brings us near will have no hold on our hearts in Jesus' name. Now see the way Daniel lived. I want you to look at Job, Job chapter 41. Job chapter 41. So that you'll be able to have the same commitment and the same state of mind. That whatever may be happening, you know. The Lord has called you. And you know the commission he has given unto you. And there will be no discouragement. There will be no disappointment. And there will be no uh, distraction. We're looking at chapter 41 of Job. Verse 24. 41, 24. His heart is as firm as a stone. We could have said that about Daniel. It's like... He had lost all emotion and all feeling. It's like he just felt this must be done. And his heart was as firm as a stone. Even as hard as a piece of neither milestone. Let's look at verse 33. Upon earth there is not, there is not like is like. Who is made without fear. Upon us at the time of Daniel, there's nobody like him. Made without fear. And the same thing will be true about you. He beholdeth all high things. He is a king over all the children of pride. He reigned and ruled over their plot, over their pride, over their persecution. Because he was a determined man. You will be that kind of man. We are looking at Isaiah chapter 50. Isaiah chapter 50. And we are looking at verse 7. Isaiah chapter 50 verse 7. For the Lord God will help me. Will he help you? Therefore shall I not be confounded. Therefore have I set my face like a flint. Therefore have I set my face like a flint. And then in Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. We're looking at it from verse 35. Romans chapter 8. Verse 35. In Romans chapter 8, verse 35, we we'll see the conviction of a real child of God. The conviction of a real man of God. This will be your conviction. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? That's what those persecutors wanted to do. That's what those princes and presidents, that's what they wanted to do. It's absolute love. It's total love. It's undying love. It's unswerving love for the Lord. They wanted him to abandon that and then to begin to fear for his life. 
And then to now begin to follow a kind of program or project or path of expediency. Ah, let me protect myself. Let me lessen my consecration, my commitment, my conviction. So that I will not die in the lion's den. But they didn't succeed. They will not succeed on us in Jesus' name. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or such? As it is written, for thy sake were killed all the day long. Were accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are, tell me, tell me that again. We are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded. Anybody persuaded there? You know Daniel was persuaded? He was a persuaded man. That's why he lived a life of devotion. His life was marked with conviction. Marked with consecration. And marked with commitment with communion, courage and consistency. Because he was persuaded there is a God in heaven. Kings may rise or fall. Persecution may arise and peace may return. Danger may be imminent and deliverance may be ascertained. Whatever the king may think favorably toward him or the president may be furious against him. Promotion in the king's palace may be awaiting him or violent death in the lion's den may be his portion. Only one sin, only one choice would he have. He will do as he did aforetime. It will do you as he did a fourth time. He made no change in his habit of communion. And when difficulties come, when dangers come, when problems arise, you will not make any change in your commitment to the Lord, in the preaching of the gospel, in what the Lord has called you to do, in worshiping the Lord on account of any decree that any man may make. As I told you before, Daniel had a holy contempt. For the righteous God dishonoring decree. And he maintained his holy concern for the glory of God. He knew his God. And his force and constant commitment was to honor and to glorify the almighty God. Whatever the reaction of the world would be. Daniel's action showed that he would not consent to the wicked decree. Neither because of fear nor desire to please man would he consent to anything contrary to God's glory. Because he was fully persuaded when the honor of God is concerned, we ought not to conceal a Christian conviction, but boldly and faithfully act and live to please God, even at the hazard of our lives. That's the attitude of the people who are fully persuaded. Any persuaded person here today? Will you keep on serving the Lord until the very end? Tell me out loud, and the Lord will be with you in Jesus' name. Verse 38, for I'm fully persuaded, I'm persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor death, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. I am not of those that turn back. You will not be of those that turn back. You'll keep on serving the Lord to the very end in Jesus' name. Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10. We're looking at verse. We're looking at verse 38. Now the just shall live by faith. But if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. But we're not of them who draw back unto perdition. Can we say that? We are not of them who draw back unto perdition. Say that again. Would you say that again? We are not of them who draw back unto perdition, but of them who that believe unto the saving of the soul. Say that. But of them that believe to the saving of the soul. Say that again. For the last time, Daniel was not of them who draw back unto perdition, but he was of the number that continued till the saving of the soul. Shidrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They were not of them that draw back unto perdition, but they were of them that believed to the saving of the soul. You and I today, by the grace of God, will keep on serving the Lord. 
our courage will not falter. Our conviction will not fail. Our commitment will not fail. We're going to keep on serving the Lord in the name of the Lord in Jesus' name. Because we're not of them who draw back unto perdition, but of them that believe to the saving of the soul. Let's rise up and talk to the Lord in prayer. You've seen what the Lord has taught us today, what has exposed to us, and we need to continue serving the Lord in commitment to the Lord without ever looking back, looking back from the Lord. Open your mouth and talk to the Lord in prayer. Make sure you are born again. Only born again people can take their stand at a time of persecution. Ordinary religious people who are not born again, they can only come to church and worship the Lord when the going is fine, when everything is peaceful, when they have bread and butter. When they have material things, that's the time they can only serve the Lord. Shallow people, superficial people, hypocritical worshippers, they only come, they only committed when all things are going fine. When there's position, when there's promotion, when there's provision, privilege. When everything is fine, unsaved, religious, churchgoers only try to serve the Lord, worship the Lord. When things are going all right, they smile, they laugh, they sing, they shout, Hallelujah, praise God, praise the Lord. There's provision, prosperity, promotion, position. There's only time they smile. Only time they're happy. Only time they pray. Only time they sing. Only time they say, I'll follow the Lord. I've decided to follow the Lord. I'm serving the Lord. I'm a child of God. But when things change, when things turn around, a little problem, a little persecution, a little difficulty, then you know the fall. Because they didn't really have grace. They didn't have real salvation. They were not true disciples of Christ. They were hypocritical, superficial, surface believers. You prove that a real child of God, your sins are forgiven, you're born again, you are trusting the Lord. You believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And your salvation is beyond any shadow of doubt. Then you will serve the Lord. We we'll see the example of Daniel. He was committed to praying. For the deliverance of the whole nation. And he knew that the lion's den, the writing, the edict was just a distraction. And he was not going to give in to that destruction. His mind was set. His heart was set. Doing what the Lord had called him to do. Is your mind set like that? Is your heart fixed like that? In spite of the lions, a decision that will not be compromised. A dedication and devotion that nothing can turn you away from serving the Lord. Distractions will come. The devil wants to get you fighting another battle. The devil wants to distract you only thinking about 
your safety, your promotion, your protection. The devil wants to distract you, only thinking about your life. But Daniel will not be distracted. Even at the age of 90, he wasn't saying, if I knew, I would have retired. And then I will not be in the midst of these princes and presidents. But in my retirement, after Nebuchadnezzar left the kingship, the royalty, at 17, that should have been enough. If I knew, I should have left the service at 75, at 80. What am I still doing here at 90? No regret. No retreat. No return. He forged on. Move on. Serve the Lord. Don't allow any distraction to swerve you or to sway you. Serve the Lord. Consecrate your life once again to the fulfillment of the Great Commission. There may be a running lion at the corner. Move on. The promises of God are yes and amen. God is not a man that is your lie. Neither the Son of Man that is your repent. As he said, shall he not do it? As he spoke, shall he not bring it to pass? Leave all the outcome in the hand of the Almighty God. And move on serving the Lord faithfully. Don't give up. Don't give in. Don't allow the princes and the presidents and the persecutors to take your love away from the Lord. Keep on loving the Lord with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and all your stress. They throw down into a lion's den. But God sent his angel. And God still has all his angels today. He still sends them. Wait on the Lord. Recommit, reconsecrate your life to the Lord. And promise him. You'll serve him till the very end of your life. Your 80s still keep on serving the Lord. Your 60s still keep on serving the Lord. Take up the baton again. Take up the service again. There's no retirement from evangelism. There's no retirement from commitment and consecration. There's no retirement from prayer. There's no retirement from the great commission. Daniel did not retire, or resign, or retreat, or go back because of the challenges in the way. Move on, serving the Lord. If you have dropped the work of the Lord because of this challenge or that challenge, recommit your life to the Lord tonight. Pick it up again. Say, Lord, I'll be like Daniel. Dare to be a Daniel. Dare to be faithful. Dare to be true. And dare to serve the Lord. Until your 80s, until your 90s, serve the Lord. Until the very end of your life, serve the Lord. Tell him, O oh Jesus, I promise to serve you to the end. I shall not fear the battle because you are by my side. Neither will I wander from the pathway because you are my guide. Lord Jesus, I sense it. I feel you near me. The world, yes, the princes, presidents, persecutors are ever near. I see the sights that dazzle. The tempting sounds, the roaring sound of lions I hear. My foes are ever near me, around me and within. But Jesus, I know you are near. Your shield, my soul, from sin from sorrow, from sickness, from danger. Let me hear this speaking in accents clear and still about the storms of passion, the moments of self-will, 
who speak to reassure me, to hasten or to control. Speak and make me listen. 